Good afternoon, and thanks for having me here and being here. It's great to have the opportunity to present to your project today. So the project I'm talking about today is titled More Education Makes You Happier, Unless You're Unemployed, and is joint work with Hannah Schiedrich-Hirsch and Daniel Kammelfer from the University of Düsseldorf. My name is Alexander Bertermann, in case you've missed it, and I'm very much looking forward to your comments. I probably do not have to motivate the outcome level life satisfaction here, but even though it's probably not necessary here to motivate the outcome level life satisfaction, nevertheless, I think it's important to stress that life satisfaction is really one of the most important measures of individual well-being, and more and more governments use population well-being as a goal. So it's therefore of central importance to understand the drivers of it. And we know a lot about some drivers, such as income and health, but the one of education is far less clear and more of a puzzle because even though there's, there's broad consensus that education improves many important other life outcomes, it then did not really translate in a meaningful way into higher well-being. So our goal is to try to clarify and enhance the understanding of this relationship and thereby also investigate this education happiness puzzle. So the first step, we confirm the close to null effect of education on well-being, also found in other settings where exogenous variation in education is used, so where the estimates have a credible causal interpretation. However, in the second step, we focus on the primary motivation of individuals for pursuing post-mandatory education, namely better labor market outcomes. So the top reasons given by prospective students to enroll, for instance, in a college, are usually employment opportunities, making more money, getting a better job, and so on. And the recent literature has really demonstrated how important these perceived monetary returns are for the education decision-making. So we focus on these domains of well-being related to the labor market, and we see, that we see there that there's a positive education effect on these domains of well-being related to the labor market, like work and pay satisfaction. And strikingly, these positive education effects for these domains of well-being related to the labor market seem to translate also into higher overall well-being for these individuals, so for individuals with a job. And in contrast, we find negative education effects for individuals without a job. So in the aggregate, these two groups cancel each other out to an average null effect. And I think it's also important to note that the difference between the effects of these groups is highly significant, and the implied magnitudes are really substantial. So one additional year of schooling is for working individuals, similar in magnitude to be going from single to having a partner. While for individuals without a job, it's comparable in size to doubling in fear of crime. So these are substantial effects. Hence, the broad consensus in literature that education has no substantial, meaningful impact on well-being appears to be misleading because our results suggest that education does in fact play a crucial role in the future well-being of individuals. The role was until now only hidden behind the average effect for individuals in all employment situations. So on average, irrespective of whether individuals are able to put their acquired skills into practice in the labor market or not. Our second main contribution, besides elevating the central role of employment status, is that we introduce new sources of exogenous variation in education when estimating the effects of uh, on well-being. So we have in total three different sources of quasi experimental variation. So that we are able to recover the education effect for individuals in different parts of the schooling distribution. So this is in contrast to existing studies in literature where only changes in the minimum schooling requirements are exploited. So we go beyond this, so beyond changes in mandatory years of schooling, by leveraging the fact that Germany experienced after the Second World War really an unprecedented number of school openings of types of schools that offer more than these mandatory years of schooling. So now let's begin by having a look at the individual data we're going to use. So the individual data is from the socioeconomic panel, or short ZEP, and the ZEP is representative of the German population, and it's really the largest, and as you probably all know, and longest running annual household survey in Germany, and really besides containing many, many variables, importantly for this study, also different measures of life satisfaction are part of every survey. So using the ZEP data, our estimation sample would then be selected as follows. So first we restrict it to individuals between the age of 25 and 60. And this is done to restrict the attention to the effects after school completion and to exclude individuals who are already retired. And on top we restrict it to individuals born between 1940 and 1980. And this is because of the sources of variation we want to use to address the self-selection of education years. So the instruments we are going to use. And the availability of instruments is also responsible why we focus on West German non-city states, because there was no comparable schooling reform in East Germany. Now, after I've talked about the individual data, the main outcome variable life satisfaction we are going to use is shown here on this slide. 
So it's a self-assessment to the question, how satisfied are you with your life? All things considered. You range on 11 point scale from 0, completely dissatisfied, to 10, completely satisfied. And to ease interpretation, this variable will later enter the estimation equations, standardized to mean 0 and standard deviation 1. So now, to so talk about the individual data and the outcome variable, let's consider now in more detail the ways we want to generate exogenous variation education. So we have in total three different approaches. So first, and also for comparison with existing literature, we start out by also exploiting changes in the minimum school requirements. So between 1956 and 1969, West German states implemented reforms that introduced a mandatory ninth grade in basic schools. And this offers us therefore a source of arguably exogenous variation education that we can exploit to estimate the effects of education for these individuals. And now, to go beyond this, so beyond these changes in mandatory years of schooling, we leverage, as mentioned earlier, the fact that Germany experienced a high number of school openings after the Second World War, of types of schools that offer more than these mandatory years of schooling. You probably know this, but as a very short institutional background, in Germany there are mainly three different school tracks. So after the primary school, children can attend one of three school tracks. So the basic school, what's the lowest degree, while intermediate school is more academically demanding and requires in total 10 years of schooling. And then the high school awards the highest secondary schooling degree available and requires in total 13 years of schooling. And now, after the Second World War, there were many openings of these more academically demanding school tracks. So for instance, between 1950 and 1970, the number of intermediate schools tripled. So this changed therefore the opportunity costs of attending these higher school tracks profoundly. Because the distance to the nearest, more academically demanding school track was greatly reduced. And as in Germany, the federal states are in charge of education policy, this increase in schooling opportunities exhibits both temporal and regional variation that is arguably independent of other determinants of long-term well-being. So it offers therefore a source of variation that you can exploit to recover also the effects for individuals in the higher part of the schooling distribution. But to start out and also for comparison with existing literature, we first leverage the fact that Germany experienced, or Germany introduced after the Second World War, a mandatory ninth grade in basic school. And given that whether individuals were affected by the reform depends on the year of birth and their state of residence when attending school, meaningful selection to treatment can, group, can plausibly rule out. However, as mentioned earlier, these reforms only affected individuals in basic schools. So they are the only compliers of the reforms. So the education effects one gets are only based on these individuals. So they cannot necessarily be interpreted as speaking for the whole education distribution. So to go beyond this and also recover the effects for individuals in the higher part of the schooling distribution, we will, as already mentioned, leverage these school openings of more academically demanding school tracks. And a bit of background information, when one looks here at the allocation of students between the different school tracks over time, it really changed quite dramatically. And this change here was not accidental, but was really actively promoted by an increasing supply of more academically demanding school tracks. So we will use these school openings, or more specifically, we will exploit the large amount of heterogeneity between, these, between the states in these school openings, because when we will use these school openings to establish quasi expensive variation education, we will of course control for state and core fixed effects to account, amongst other things, for general time trend, and different potentially endogenous levels of schools. So that means that we effectively use state deviations from the nationwide trend to identify the parameters. And to give you an idea of the variation that we have, we see here the change in the supply of intermediate schools between 1950 and 1990. And on this, we see the same for high schools. So now, after I've talked about the individual data, the outcome variable, and the ways we want to generate exogenous variation education, now let's consider in more detail the estimation strategy. So I mentioned already the instrument to variables approach is used. So in the first stage, we estimate the effect of the respective instruments on years of schooling. And the second stage, then, life satisfaction is regressed on these instrumented years of schooling. And we control for state and cohort fixed effects. And given that we use values from different survey waves, we also control for survey fixed effects. So now, let's look at the results. So the first analysis here indicates no causal effect of education on overall well-being. So results in column one, show the effect when the variation induced by the compulsory schooling reform in Germany is used. And the null effect there is in line with 
findings, for example, for compulsory schooling reforms for the UK. And then in column two and three, we see the results when we leverage the school openings of more academically demanding school tracks. And the corresponding results tell exactly the same story. So the null effects seem therefore not limited to individuals whose education years were shifted by the compulsory schooling reform, but instead seem to apply to individuals in all parts of the schooling distribution. And given that there seem to be no significant differences along the educational distribution, we will use in the following all three instruments in the same first stage equation to establish exogenous variation education. But I have also in the appendix that every result I'm going to present is separate by each instrument, and the patterns are exactly the same. So now, after documenting no effect of education on overall well-being, we now look more closely at domains of well-being related to the labor market. Because as mentioned, the primary motivation of individuals for pursuing post-mandatory education are better labor market outcomes. And we see, in fact, that education improves these domains of well-being related to the labor market. So one addition year of schooling increases satisfaction with work by one 8% of standard deviation, and relatedly, education also improves satisfaction with pay. So one additional year of schooling increases satisfaction with pay by around 5% of standard deviation. And kind of intrigued by these findings, we hypothesized that men also translate into higher overall well-being for these individuals, as income and employment are usually ranked among the most important drivers of how satisfied individuals are with their life as a whole. And results in panel B here confirm this expectation. So they reveal that one additional year of schooling increases overall life satisfaction for individuals with a job by around 6% of standard deviation. And to put the magnitude of the effect in perspective, I think it's really worth to repeat the comparison mentioned earlier. So this is comparable in size to going from single to having a partner. And importantly, these substantial positive education effects also has stark implications for those without a job, due to the average null effect presented earlier for all individuals. And also result here in panel B shows these expected decrease in well-being for individuals without a job. So for them, one additional year of schooling decreases overall life satisfaction by around 40% of the standard deviation. And to repeat the comparison mentioned earlier, this is comparable in size to a doubling in fear of crime. It's a substantial effect, meaning that in total, the null effect presented earlier, and the broad consensus in, in the literature that education does not really improve over well being in a meaningful way, a way, a way, seems to be misleading because these results suggest that education does in fact play a crucial, crucial role in the future well being of individuals. The direction just depends on the employment situation. So the average effect must therefore size of heterogeneity by the employment status. Now, after establishing these baseline results, we now look a little more closely at the employment status and investigate the extent to which these pa observed pattern could be driven by endogeneity issues related to the employment status. So now, in pattern A, we will report separate coefficients for individuals who are out of the labor force and for those who are unemployed. And the coefficients are rather similar. And tests for equality between the coefficients also reveal that we fail to reject the hypothesis of statistically significant differences by wide margins. However, the coefficients for individuals who are out of the labor force are estimated quite imprecisely, probably due to the substantial heterogeneity of that group. So we refrain there from interpreting them and focus instead more on unemployed individuals. However, in general, the unemployment scenario is, of course, often endogenous with events and decisions related to life satisfaction. So the corresponding results could, in principle, just represent heterogeneity issues related to the unemployment scenario. So to help us address these concerns and restrict the variation unemployment to parts that are exogenous to the individual life satisfaction, in panel B, we will leverage planned closures. And we see the corresponding results. So for individuals who were unemployed, as a result of a planned shutdown, are very similar to the average effect for all unemployed individuals shown in panel A, making endogeneity issues of unemployment scenario an unlikely driver of the results, because if they would be driving our results, we should expect to see systematic differences between the baseline estimates and the ones where these respective concerns are at least greatly reduced. Now, finally, to get also a little bit closer to exogenous variation in employment, we will leverage the panel structure of the individual data. I can talk maybe later 
a bit more detail about it, but a very short summary. So in the first step, the first step we perform a median split of the estimation sample based on exogenous variation. So this helps overcome the problem that education is of course time invariant in the age and develop our samples individuals, for our sample individuals. And then in the second step, we exploit the pellet structure of the individual data by focusing on within individual variation of employment. And the corresponding results, or the corresponding pattern, let me say like this, is similar. So individuals with a job are substantially happier with more education. So now, a natural next step is then to ask why we find this overall pattern. So why find increase in well-being with more education for individuals with a job, but a decrease in well-being with more education for individuals without a job. So to tease out what is behind this and help us think more clearly about mechanisms, we consider here a standard utility function that is augmented with aspirations. So utility depends in that case on direct labor market outcomes and the gap to aspired outcomes. And as a recent literature really demonstrated the crucial role of these perceived monetary returns for the educational decision making, it seems intuitive that the aspired labor market outcomes are also increasing with education. Now, if one has a job, the own labor market outcomes are, of course, on average, also increasing with more education, so that one is able to keep track with rising aspirations. This, however, is, of course, not the case if one doesn't have a job. Then the gap between realized and aspired labor market outcomes is likely to increase with more education, implying, therefore, a decrease in well-being with more education. But to estimate the impact of this gap empirically, we have to quantify or approximate aspired labor market outcomes somehow. And we do that by defining them as the jackknife average of income of individuals among the same educational attainment, state, birth cohort, and gender group. And then we are decomposing the main effect shown before with a mediation type of analysis by including income and the gap to aspired income in the main regression. So each bar here on this slide represent a total positive education effect from the baseline result shown before. And then we investigate the extent to which this positive effect shrinks once we account for income and once we account for the gap to aspired income. Or, to put it differently, the percentages here show the extent to which this po total positive education effect materializes through these moderators. I mean, this is of course only a descriptive exercise, given that we don't have exogenous variation in the mediators, but we see descriptively that income seems to be a very important moderator, while in contrast, the gap to aspired income does not explain much, which is intuitive because individuals with a job earn, on average, similar to the expected value based on the education level. This, however, is of course not the case for individuals without a job. So for them, this gap is substantial. And we see that this, with education increasing gap, does in fact contribute a sizable amount to the decrease in well-being with more education for individuals without a job. Direct income, which means for this group things like unemployment benefits, maternity benefits, and so on, does not explain much. So in total, we find therefore the intuitive result that the positive effect for, education, for individuals with a job materializes to a substantial degree through income, while the decrease in well-being with more education materializes for those without a job to a sizable degree through the gap to aspired income. So now to conclude, and briefly recap what have we actually learned. So how has analysis improved the understanding of the relationship between education and well-being? I think there are mainly two new insights. So first, we document that the relationship between education and well-being appears to be independent of the education level. So previous studies exploiting quasi-experimental variation were only able to identify parameters for individuals in the lower part of the schooling distribution. So we move in that respect beyond existing work by not only utilizing mandatory schooling, but also leveraging the build-up of intermediate and high schools after Second World War. And doing that, we find there seem to be no significant differences along the educational distribution. And second, we identify the employment status as an important driver of the direction of the education effect. So for individuals with a job, well-being increases with more education, while for individuals without a job, well-being decreases with more education. So one has two groups with significant education effects. However, when one abstract from this heterogeneity to present one overall result, the effects are insignificant and close to zero. So restricting the education effect to one coefficient 
appears to be misleading because it suggests that education has no impact on life satisfaction, when in fact the overall insignificant right, uh, result seem to be driven by opposite side education effects that seem to cancel each other out. So to conclude, education does in fact play a crucial role in the future well-being of individuals. The direction just depends on the employment status and if one is able to put the acquired skills into practice in the labor market or not. From a policy perspective, our results speak therefore in favor of policies that encourage highly educated individuals to work, like creating tax systems that do not penalize double earner families or building more childcare facilities. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much for listening.